Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Art Ocal. We're here every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. The NHL on ESPN YouTube. We begin with the news of London, Ontario. The uh, World Junior Hockey Championship 2018 Hockey Canada sexual assault scandal. Five NHL players, current and former, turned themselves into police. A press conference has occurred uh, with the London Police Department. Before we get to the coverage from our colleague Kristen Shilton Wish, uh, who is covering this story in London. Let's talk about the NHL and their response through All-Star Week as this question was asked to Commissioner Gary Bettman. Uh, they conducted an, uh, a separate investigation of this matter. How did you feel about how this was handled? Well, I mean, it was a bit of whiplash, right? When uh, Bettman held his ca uh, press conference at the All-Star Game where they start with all this news about the Olympics and international tournaments and then... You know, about 20 minutes later, we're talking about one of the more uh, just abhorrent stories that we've had in hockey in a very long time with the Hockey Canada scandal. Um, you know, I, I think it was what we expected from the NHL. Uh, they've conducted their own investigation, like you said, did not talk to the alleged victim. She declined to participate in the investigation, which, of course, is her right. Um, and, and not releasing anything about that investigation until the London police legal proceedings and all that gets through. Uh, they didn't want to, they've long said they don't want to interfere with that process. And I think this is kind of keeping with it. Um, I think we were all very curious about what the NHL would do vis-a-vis -vis these players. It's the first time we've heard from them since the players were charged. And as far as termination of their contracts, I mean, Gary Bettman said there are like steps that need to happen in order for that to happen. And, and a lot of it has to do with finding fault. And it's difficult to do that during an ongoing, uh, you know, legal investigation. So basically, they're saying that they can't take any punishment without knowing how the legal proceedings play out. Please recall a few years ago when Los Angeles Kings defenseman Slava Voinov was suspended for an entire season by the NHL. That was after he pled no contest to uh, uh, domestic violence charges in, in the court. So, you know, after the legal thing was done, the NHL took action. Uh, so if nothing, I think they're going to kick it to the teams. You know, these players have all left their teams, both the NHL and the NHLPA don't expect them to play again this season. They're all free agents after the season. So if there's anything as far as like docking pay or anything, it might happen from a team perspective, but I don't think that's going to occur. Um, I think we're all kind of figuring out when we're going to hear from the NHL with regard to releasing something about these findings that they had in their investigation. It's probably not going to happen until the leading proceeding, the legal proceedings are done. Uh, and after that, we might learn what they've learned. And after that, uh, you know, the NHL has said they will respond appropriately to whatever is uh, comes out during these trials. So I guess we're all you know, playing a waiting game to see if there's going to be anything punitive from the league with regard to these players. Joining us now on the drop, Kristen Shilton. Uh, Kristen, our good colleague from ESPN.com. You were there at the London Police Press Conference. What was your biggest takeaway from what we heard on Monday? Well, I guess it was frustrating in a way that there weren't more answers. I think that was probably my biggest takeaway is I think we all sort of expected that there would be some kind of light shed on why there was an investigation open in 2018 that closed in 2019. And then it was subsequently reopened in 2022. And we didn't get a lot of clarity on why that is, because as the detective chief said today, uh, when he spoke, the reason for that lag time is part of the proceeding. So what's happening right now in the court system, um, they're not going to you know, give us a lot just based on that, that this is still very much an ongoing investigation. It is one investigation, as was made clear to us, not two. But we did get the clarity in terms of the players. So we know that it is one count of sexual assault against Carter Hart, against Dylan Dubé, against Cal Foote, and against Alex Formington. But it's two counts against Michael McLeod, one pertaining to his own behavior and one to his behavior involving someone else in this case. So at least we do have that. And we know that there are not pending charges against any other players, despite in the victim's uh, original claim, she had mentioned eight players, or she had referenced eight players. They said that they only had reasonable grounds to bring charges against five. So that's kind of in, in that and bolts perspective, what we kind of have nailed down here today. But, you know, it's obviously, Greg, as you know, there's so much more implication in terms of hockey and culture and um, from the 
uh, you know, the site of victims, it took six years to get here. And the detective chief apologized for that, that it took six years to bring charges in this case when she was cooperative the entire time. So there's, it's, there's a bigger social context to it, but in terms of actual hard news, that's kind of what we take away from today. You know, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, from the outside looking in, it, it seemed like the, the vibe was very much uh, kind of a, a combative against the police on this one as far as them dropping the ball in the investigation and then not really having, like you said, any answers as to why that was. Was was the vibe much more about, less about the, the let's say, the, the situation at hand with the players than it was simply, you know, trying to figure out the police angle and, and why they were neglectful and, and bringing charges the first time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the chief was very clear. He's like, I don't know anything about hockey. This is not about hockey. And for them, it's not right. Like it, and for this community, it's really not as well. I mean, it was uh, partly the community pushing back in 2022 and helping the police with this uncovering of new evidence. Now, that's another thing. Was this evidence available to the investigators in in 20 uh, in 2018? as opposed to, or was this newly discovered? We don't know, they wouldn't say. So that's something as well. But um, just in terms of, I think the community is questioning, why did it take so long? Why was this case that opened essentially in June of 2018 closed so swiftly in February of 2019, but then they reopened this in 2022 and here we are in 2024, just getting to the charges. Why did this take so long? What does it say? Um, really just just about the London Police Department even being able to handle a case like this. And the chief was asked, why is this not being turned over to another police department that could handle it better than obviously whomever did uh, in, uh, in 2018? But it is worth noting that it was a different chief then. Steve Williams uh, was, was the guy then handling this investigation. There's a new person obviously now in charge. So but at the same time, it's it's still a collective group, right? Like it's still, it does fall at their feet that whatever fell through the cracks at the time that's been recently found, discovered, whatever you want to call it, um, if it was available to those investigators in 2018 and just wasn't pursued, it just looks a terrible on them but then also what does it say to victims that are their claims being investigated seriously are they being looked at thoroughly and that just brings up a lot more questions about uh i think this the police services due diligence at the time and then obviously how it's translated into this new uh phase of the investigation being started right did they say anything about preferential treatment for them being junior hockey champions and NHL players. In other words, some people wondering about the the length of time, for example, they had before they they were they had to turn themselves in. I mean, absolutely. That question was asked and it had to be because you're looking at, you know, quote unquote celebrities in that were in town being feted at a banquet. I mean, yeah. that's what they were doing here was that, you know, they were obviously at the center of they were the centers of attention and there were a lot of people paying a lot of money at the event uh, right before the alleged assault occurred to see these players. And of course the police denied that there was any kind of preferential treatment there and that it had nothing to do with their status or anything like that. Uh, but it, you know, it's, if you read between the lines, I mean, the fact that there wasn't any, you know, revelation made by the chief in terms of why the um, discrepancy in time is existing because it is part of the proceedings. I mean, what does that mean? You yeah. might not find out because, I mean, this case has been adjourned now until April the 30th. Yeah. So we won't, you know, this could take years. We have no idea when we're going to get more of this information. So right now, I mean, of course, they're going to deny that the players got any sort of, um, you know, special treatment. But I guess we won't know entirely until everything uh, is finally made public at whatever point this case comes to a close. You and I were both in Toronto for the All-Star Game. We heard the Gary Bettman, Bill Daly press conference regarding the Hockey Canada investigation. Obviously, the NHL has done their own investigation. They're not going to release any results until the legal proceedings are done. Uh what was said by the London police with regards to the NHL investigation and all of this? Well, uh, it was Sergeant uh, Detective Dan who uh, said that she has not heard from the NHL in all of this. 
So mm. if she, you know, she said that, that it's been several months, she was not part of the original uh, investigative team in 2018. She came on after that. So this was kind of her first uh, opening of the inquiry, but it didn't seem like the NHL had been in any kind of contact at this point with the police. And now we both heard um, Gary Bettman say that they, the NHL had spoken to every player on that team, but they didn't ever speak to the victim was within her rights, obviously not to, uh, you know, not to speak with them, but in terms of the NHL investigation, I mean, Greg, they said they're not going to release their findings until the criminal proceedings are done too. It almost feels like everyone's just kind of like waiting, like for everyone to just kind of forget that this is going on and we'll see when, you know, when the Ontario court system, which is backlogged, like it seemingly every court system gets to this particular case, but uh, what it means for those five players in terms of their careers, I suppose, or in ter- like, we know they've been released. We know they're not being held uh, at this point. So do they return to their teams? Do they, you know, they're all going to be free. The four in the NHL will be free agents uh, in the summer. So what does it mean for them? I guess we'll find out from the NHL. It doesn't seem like the police obviously are going to have anything to say on that front. So uh, I, I think everything is just kind of at a standstill now until the case uh, picks up again in April. But I, we know that criminal proceedings don't happen quickly and no one can attest to that better right now than the alleged victim who's waited six years for today to finally uh, to come. And her lawyer released a statement as well, just saying, you know, that she's pleased that this is finally moving forward. That's great. Hey, for those interested in the case, Kristen had a great episode of ESPN Daily that you should check out that really spells out the timeline of this thing. And she also has a timeline, in fact, on ESPN.com that covers all the details of this thing. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us from London. Uh, Appreciate your reporting on this and we'll uh, keep on it. Yes, thank you so much for having me, guys. Well, the Hockey Canada news almost overshadowed what was a successful all-star weekend for the National Hockey League in Toronto, most specifically for Connor McDavid, who uh, won the skills competition that he helped the league redesign. I caught up with McDavid recently as he signed on as the face of sports drink body armor in Canada. And we talked about the Oilers' incredible winning streak and a lot of other topics, including his upcoming wedding this summer. Here's Connor McDavid. All right, Connor McDavid, tell me how this partnership between you and body, body armor came about. Yeah, um, you know, I've been with BioSteel for a really long time previous to, to Body Armor. Um, you know, and obviously that that uh, that brand is 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 no longer. And I'm obviously looking for the next best thing, um, one that checks all the boxes for me. Um, and I think all my partnerships are are very um are very natural. Um, you know, and I think it's CIBC, you know, you know, I've been banking with them forever. Um CCM is you know, skates I've been using um since I was a kid. So um, you know, first and foremost, fell in love with the product, um, you know, when I started trying it and, um, the fact that they're trying to bring it to Canada and they are bringing it to Canada, um, you know, kind of only adds the, to the excitement. Obviously I'm a super proud Canadian and want, uh, what's best, uh, in Canada. And, you know, I think body armor, body armor is that and excited to be part of that process, um, and helping bring it to Canada. Cool. You've been in the league since 2015. I was curious. I know body armor has got this whole you know, very all natural product kind of thing going on for it. How has nutrition changed in your time in the NHL? Has it, has it changed significantly or was it already in a kind of a, a different place when you came into the league? Yeah. You said I'd, I've been in the league since I was, since 2015, I started training with Gary Roberts in 2012. So yeah. I, had already, I had already about three years of, 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 of working with Gary and his team there. And, and um, you know, you know how strong, how strong and, and passionate they are about, um, about nutrition and everything like that. So I had already got a good, uh, a good dose of that before coming to the NHL. And, and, um, you know, so I, I knew it was super important and, um, you know, and that's why I think the, 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 the partnership with, with body armor, um, is, uh, is one that fits, um, you know, obviously they're super passionate about, uh, about their product and, you know, using only real ingredients and, and real flavors and, and all that. And, and, um, you know, and I think, that's all. Uh, that's all stuff that uh, is important to me as well. You survived training with Gary Roberts. I think is probably the uh, better, better <laughs> phrase to use. <laughs> well, I've been I've been with him since, like you said, since 2012, and and still train with them to this day. So yeah, um, yeah, they're they're great over there. 
They're great. They are great. Uh, let's talk a little all-star. Um, I was wondering how much did you enjoy helping to revamp the skills competition, knowing that the all-star game was going to be in Toronto and knowing that, you know, obviously you're helping to put on a really good show for like the people in your community, basically. Yeah. Well, I think, I think after last year, um, everyone maybe knew there needed to be, um, a change, um, just it got a little bit out of hand, I thought, on, on some of the some of the gimmicky things, and and uh, we're we're missing kind of the the essence of of what an all star game is, and that's to that's to showcase the talent of of the athletes, the hockey players, and 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 the skills that that we have because they are unique, um, you know. So I'm excited that uh, you're going to see some more um, more, I'll say, normal events, um, you know, which is. Uh, something that I think players are excited about and having 12 of the best players in the world go at it for, for one kind of crown, um, I think is, is exciting. Um, it's a, a unique opportunity and, and, uh, something that I hope the fans enjoy. Plus you saved a bunch of NHL players from having to go into a dunk tank in Toronto in January, which I think is pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah, noble of you. <laughs> yeah. It's not easy to, not easy to dunk someone when, when it's, when it's iced over. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it'll be, it'll be a fun event. I'm looking forward to it. Sweet. Have you and Leon talked about your draft strategy yet? We haven't. I'm hoping that Will Arnett knows hockey. Uh, I think we'll <laughs> hand over the, the the draft card to him and, and let him do his thing. But uh, no, we haven't come up with a strategy yet. That's sweet. That's sweet. I mean, you know, it's a good GM audition for a guy who played <laughs> Batman. Uh, right. <laughs> as we speak, the Oilers are on a massive winning streak. Um, is there some level of satisfaction for you in proving some of the people wrong that may have you know, called you guys overrated or said, you know, hey, look, these are the real Oilers when things are going down. Like, do you take any satisfaction in kind of, let's just say, reclaiming the uh, the 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 expectations and the and uh, the you know how good the Oilers are? Yeah, I think when you're last place in the NHL six weeks in, uh, people call you everything under the sun. So um, it's um, it's rewarding for our group that. You know, we've stuck together um, and we've kind of dug ourselves out of that. Um, I think our group has oddly gotten comfortable doing that. You know, I think of the back of the past two seasons, we've kind of had those stretches. I think back to the 21-22 season, you know, we can't win a game for six weeks and, you know, ultimately bring in Woody and go on a great run and, and, and make, you know, make some noise in the playoffs and, you know, we were kind of a bubble playoff team last year until we traded for at home and go on this amazing run. And, and, uh, and again, um, made a little bit of noise in the playoffs. So we're ultimately a little bit used to, uh, used to some of that noise that, uh, that negativity that, that comes from, from the media sometimes. But, you know, like I said, we stuck together in there. We have stuck together in there through it all. And, um, feels good to, uh, just to be in a position, be back in the mix of things. Um, coming down here in the in the second half yeah when Woody was fired you said a good man lost his job and I was wondering like you can never know when these streaks are going to happen you never know why they don't happen for certain coaches with the benefit of hindsight do you think this could have happened under Jay or did you think that maybe there needed to have to be a change at that point in the season for you guys to get to this point uh, that's a great question um, I think that there was a lot of um a lot of things that were going on when we had Jay that were, you know, I always say you can feel when things are starting to turn and, and we could feel that things were, were turning and our game was getting there. Um, yeah. What he, what he was missing, you know, I wasn't playing very well. Um, so when his, your best player is not playing very well, um, you're going to struggle. Our goaltending wasn't great. The penalty kill was struggling. Um, we couldn't keep pucks out of our net. Um, that's not a lot of things to do with, with the coaching staff. So, um, we felt that things were going to turn, um, you know, and ultimately they have, um, it's too bad that, that Woody lost his job because we all really did, um, care for him and, um, you know, he's a great person and a great coach and, and he'll land on his feet somewhere for sure in the NHL. And, um, but well, with all that being said, I think Chris has come in and done an amazing job. Um, he's really done. Amazing work. He's got a great hockey mind. Um, he's super smart. Um, he definitely is is different than than the coaches I've had in, in years past. You know, he's not uh, maybe your um, typical hockey 
guy. He's not old school or anything like that. So he's, uh, he's definitely a, a, a fresh voice. And um, like I said, he's got a great hockey mind and he's done, done, done really good work. Cool. Uh, I always like when you talk about the league. I think you got one of the more interesting minds when it comes to the direction of the NHL, both on the ice, off the ice. Earlier this month or uh, early January, you talked about that offside review that happened with you guys and uh, how long it took and everything like that. And it became kind of a big story around the league. And I was wondering, you said that the guys just want clarity on the rules. And one of the things that I think would give it clarity is if we just got rid of offside in the video review process, we just didn't make it reviewable anymore. <laughs> do you think, of, I mean, do, would you agree with that? Or do you, do you like the idea of it still being reviewable and we just have to kind of tweak the way we do it? Well, something that maybe is interesting is, is putting a, a time limit on the, on the, on the review. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't tell it's offside within a minute, it probably doesn't really matter. Um, or 30 seconds or whatever, you know, um, when we're zooming in and and zooming in and you zoom in until I said this before you zoom in until you can't zoom in any longer it's uh it's probably not a huge deal um what's actually funny about that is uh the next night I scored that goal in Detroit and we got back to the bench and we're like we don't even know if it's offside or not so like they were they were trying to challenge they didn't know what the rule was it was just it was very very funny so ultimately they didn't even challenge but um, you know, it's kind of funny how, you know, I made those comments on the next night. It was, uh, it actually went in our favor. So we'll, uh, we'll take that, but, um, yeah. You put it out in the world and then, and then it, you know, <laughs> then it, you benefited from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. speaking of rules and, and clocks, in fact, I covered the GM meetings, uh, recently and they talked about some maybe changes to the three on three overtime and trying to discourage teams from slowing down the pace. Obviously the Oilers with you have been a, a very exciting three on three team through the years. You probably heard about it. What did you think about them trying to try to tweak the overtime rules a little bit? Yeah, I, I like it. Um, again, within reason, I just, I don't want it to be too gimmicky or anything like that or, or hard to understand for fans or for players. Um, you know, but if there's something that's clear and, and obvious and that makes sense um, to everybody, I think, you know, to anything to improve the game is 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 a great thing, and um, I'm all for uh, I'm all for improving overtime. And um, if that's a clock, great. If not, then you know um, it is what it is. Cool. Two more for you. Uh, who's your favorite current non-hockey athlete to watch? My favorite current non-hockey athlete. I'm gonna go with a fellow body armor guy and Christian McCaffrey right now <laughs> for the Super Bowl. Um, the guy's on fire. He's had an absolutely amazing year. Um, I was watching the game last night and, and, uh, he scored a touchdown and the announcer said death taxes and Christian McCaffrey scoring a touchdown are, are the only guarantees. And, um, that's what it feels like right now with him. He's, uh, he's unstoppable. It's kind of weird hearing Connor McDavid talk about another athlete's inevitability. I mean, that's like, that's like what we talk about with you all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean, some, some years, yeah. Yeah, some years, right? McCaffrey's so interesting because I think, you know, watching that game too, they almost talked about him in that Barry Sanders way. And I never really thought about it that way where he goes like two yards, two yards, three yards, 60 yards. And like, it doesn't <laughs> matter. They're not looking for him to run 10 yards a clip, but they know eventually he's going to get his. Yeah. I mean, that's what it feels like. Honestly, you give him the ball enough times, he's going to he's gonna break it loose. Um, yeah, he's just been amazing. Like it's uh, it's been fun to watch. Cool. Finally, you're a very busy guy. You got the hockey Oilers thing. You got being Connor McDavid thing. You got the promotional thing and the endorsement thing. The people want to know, what is your role in wedding planning ahead of your nuptials <laughs> in July? What is, what is Connor McDavid responsible for in setting this thing up? Connor McDavid is responsible for getting his guys dressed and down the aisle. That is all. <laughs> um, we uh, took care of that this morning. Had a, had a, had a, had a call this morning with, uh, with the guys that'll be dressing us up. So my job is done. Um, and uh, now I just got to worry about getting them down. So no cake tasting, no, no DJ playlist, just show up <laughs> and make sure everybody looks good. That's my, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I've been assigned, which is, uh, which is good. It's a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Connor, you're the best. I always love talking to you, man. And, uh, and uh, good, have fun this weekend. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks to Connor McDavid for joining us here on the show. You are listening to The Drop, a.k.a. the Tortured Hockey Fan Department. 
Uh, <laughs> you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts. There it is. Uh, let us know in the comments, by the way. We're trying to get a little bit more active in the YouTube comments, so feel free to uh, chirp us, agree with us. Whatever comes to mind, we will be there to continue the conversation along. That about does it for us here on this edition of The Drop. Every Tuesday, Friday, don't forget, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well, the NHL on ESPN YouTube. Should we officially change our name to the Tortured Hockey Fan Department? <laughs> Only if we want to get back at an ex. That's, you know, Taylor <laughs> dropped the name of the album. Everybody assumed it was, she was entering her literary era. But no, it's it's a reference to her ex, which is beautiful. And a group chat, right? Is that what that yeah, is? And a, like and a group chat, chat with, with Paul Mescal. Again, like never underestimate what an assassin this person is when it comes to previous relationships. Yeah. I love it. That's why I love her. Not a chance I want to mess with the Swifties ever. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Take care. <laughs>